Good afternoon, Matthias. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us this year, and we really appreciate your attendance. Thanks, Ramon. Nice to, nice to be in the meeting. Thank you. And for our audiences, Mr. Fave is the co-managing partner at Procuritas, the chairman of Bien's Ilpleje and Bergsta, and a board member of Cotas and Piers. And just to start us off, can you spend a few minutes to give us a brief outline of your background and career, as well as the history of Procuritas? Yeah, if I start with my personal background, I'm actually an engineer from the beginning. Uh, and then I worked a couple of years at Ericsson, the telecom company, in the end of the 90s. And then I took an MBA at INSEAD, the French business school, or the business school based in France, I would say. Uh, yeah, and yeah. then I started working in Procuritas after that. And Procuritas is a, a mid-market buyout firm in the Nordic countries. So we focus very much on doing growth and buyouts, uh, helping companies to do what we call transformative growth journeys. Um, I think it's a short introduction. Absolutely. Um, and just going further into your personal career. So you started your career in consultancy with uh, Ericsson before moving to private equity. Um, so my question is, so what was your biggest takeaways from your time at Ericsson as a strategic consultant? I think it's a number of things, but I, you know, when I worked in Ericsson, it was the telecom bonanza in the end of the 90s. And you know, I was traveling around the world. I was 25, 26, 27 years old, and I had a fantastic journey with Ericsson. So I think just this international flavor, I think that was great for me. Um, but then also the fact being a consultant and help in that case, telecom companies, telecom operators to, to improve their business. And I was, you know, in this strategy uh, department. So I think it was um, it's a great learning school uh, for, for actually taking the next step in my, in my career. Yeah. And what prompted you to move into private equity? Because we know that you've done an MBA at INSEAD. Um, so was that, you know, a factor in you making the decision to uh, transition across? Yeah, I think the reason I wanted to do an MBA was that I wanted to, you know, sh not change career, but I wanted to take the next step in my career. And I always had this feeling that I would uh, work with investments. And, and uh, I, I don't know why, but I think that has been since, uh, since, I, was, since I was young. Even if, you know, if I studied in engineering, I was always focused on, making uh, something in business and, and investments. So I think that was, um, you know, it was a natural step for me after my MBA to, to start working with, uh, with, within private equity. I see. And when you first start entered the, so the Nordic private equity space, um, how was the level of deal activity? Um, and was there anything that surprised you as a new joiner? But I think, you know, to be 100% honest, I had no clue basically about uh, private equity. <laughs> I, I knew what private equity was, but you know how it is as a student. You yeah, think yeah. you have an idea, but you don't really know. Uh, and I think my, uh, what I didn't understand was the big difference between you know, small mid cap private equity and large cap private equity. And uh, you know, it was more a coincidence that I uh, ended up in in a, in a smaller uh, mid cap firm than than in a large buyout firm. But if I look back now, uh, you know, it was a hundred percent spot on for me because you know, having a consulting background, having an interest in, in business, helping companies, uh, you know, this space is just so much more interesting from that perspective. You know, I have friends that have worked in large cap buyouts for 10 years and, you know, the number of deals that you, that you do is just very limited in the smaller uh, end of the market. It's, 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 it's happening more and you can in, have more impact on the companies that, that you acquire. I see. Um, and you first joined, uh, who was your mentor? Um, and you, can you also talk a little bit more about the role of mentorship, uh, especially now that you've become the co-managing partner of the firm? I don't. I did not have a formal mentor. Uh, it was not that developed. This was back in the beginning of you know, 2001, 2002. Mm. Uh, I, it's probably something I regret. Um, I think I, you know, I probably looked up to the senior people in the firm at that time, 
Uh, and I think over the years, what I've learned a lot from is to, you know, I've worked with many seasoned chairmen in our portfolio companies. I've um, worked with many seasoned um, CEOs in the portfolio companies. And I think they have taught me quite a few things. Uh, and uh, even if they have not been mentor in a formal way, I think they have been uh, at least uh, inspiring for me. And, and uh, in some cases, also people that I've, I've used as, as mentors. Uh, I would recommend anyone to, to get a mentor, uh, and, and especially if it's someone from outside your organization. I think just, it's, just, it's just great to have uh, someone, someone to talk to. Um, so I think now in Procuritas, we have a more formalized system that every new joiner gets a mentor internally in the, in the company. Uh, that you, you know, typically have your development talks uh, twice a year and, and you have a process for following up that, that um, you should be able to talk to talk about anything, basically. Another thing that I personally has started in Procuritas and also I, I urged my colleague to do uh, is to get a coach, a professional coach. Uh, and I think, you know, I've tried various types, but to have someone with the more you know professional um, you know coaching ability i think that's great as well and and in my case it's more of a coming more from the psychology uh, uh, area uh, but I, I know some others are more you know business coaches but i think that's that's another thing it's not a mentor but it's it's something that i think i would urge anyone to get absolutely no that's really interesting so thank you for that and uh, i'll just move now into more about procuritas about ESG and also the Nordic private equity scene. So just as a starter, do you mind briefly introduce our audience to Procuritas investment strategy? Yeah, sure. No, Procuritas, uh, we have basically concluded that we are good in building niche market leaders through what we call transformative growth. Uh, and we do that in um, through digital growth or, uh, or buy and build. And uh, we focus on four different sectors. One uh, bigger sector that we call uh, service consolidation. Uh, it's typically that you find a you know, service industry that you think there is an opportunity to consolidate. Uh, I think that is the bread and butter for us. I think half of our deals is in that segment. Uh, and we think it's just a very good way of investing. And because you can start with a pretty small platform and grow it through acquisition. And uh, it's, you know, it's high upside, but it's also somewhat lower risk from, from doing that. Another segment is uh, what we call digital consumer. Uh, you know, a consumer company with a digital uh, angle or footprint. We have done some online retail investments, uh, which have been super successful for us. Um, a th a third segment is what we call software, uh, where we have done some niche software, not the, not the broad software deals, but um, uh, more niche software. software. And then we also sometimes do more selectively a niche industrial uh, kind of leads. See, um, and so just following up on that, so on your website, you've talked a lot about um, how you're looking for, um, you know, three main criteria uh, along with other criteria. But, um, but you've mentioned, you know, you're looking for companies who are niche leader, um, companies that have a strong team and those with business potential. So just in the context of the Nordic market, um, how do, would you define niche leader? Um, and especially now that you've talked about the digital and the IT sp and tech space, um, how, you know, what does that mean? And who are, you, who are you really looking for? I think a niche leader for us is, uh, it's actually what we are looking for is, is some sort of uniqueness, um, something that's sticky over time. And I would say uh, typically it's a company with a um, strong market position. It can be that I have a strong uh, market position in, in a geography uh, or a part of Sweden or part of any Nordic country. Uh, or it could be that they have a, you know, a global market position or European market position in a certain niche. Uh, so I think that is probably something that we are very much uh, focusing on in finding the the, you know, the niche position in a company and, uh, and preferably with the potential to, to grow within that niche. Um, but there, another type of niche is also that uh, it could be some sort of uniqueness in terms of business model or technology uh, that we have, I've seen uh, over the last 
five years, you have seen certain very interesting businesses that are built within the online area uh, that are selling products uh, direct to the consumer. You know, it could be difficult to find the niche. Uh, you know, the when we bought sofa company, for instance, it's not unique to sell sofas, uh, and sofa company will never be a niche player within uh, sofas. Yeah. But uh, but what we were strong at was to sell uh, the sofas directly to consumer through our own web shop. Uh, so we would say that sofa can, company had a uh, unique business model, uh, how they sold the sofas. Uh, so we designed the sofas in Denmark, produced them in Vietnam and sold it on our website. Uh, so I think the, the niche in that sense was more the, the business model, uh, the way we sold the sofas. And we could always sell the sofas to, you know, designed in Denmark to a lower price than anyone else because we cut, all, cut out all the middlemen that, that typically uh, are predominant in the, in the furniture business. I see. So not, uh, so not only the fact of the market being niche, but also in that the uniqueness of the business model or the business strategy. That's, That's really right. interesting. Um, and also in terms of a strong team, so how do you define that and what do you look for? Because you work very closely with uh, CEOs and C-suite executives. Uh, what are you looking for in their team? It's a great question. I think it's uh, probably one of the more central themes that we have uh, when we make investments. Because in our part of the market, it's uh, super important that you have a strong CEO uh, and, 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 uh, and obviously a strong team. Uh, and I think we have made, I made mistakes uh, from time to time. Uh, and I think I've learned the hard way in, in many cases. Uh, but we've also been very successful. And I think you get a little bit better uh, over time to, to find this, what is a strong team. Um, and I think it's, uh, especially the CEO, I would say is super important. Uh, obviously that they have the right background, the right uh, experience, but also the right attitude uh, that, uh, that he is open to ideas, open to listen, uh, and he gets people with him um, or her. So I think it's uh, I, it's it's not one one thing uh, I could actually highlight. But I think what we have learned is that the most important thing is to to get to know uh, the management team and the CEO before we make the transaction. Uh, okay. So we have uh, we always make what we call a value creation plan together with the management before we actually do the acquisition. Uh, that means that we, uh, first of all, have, we have time together. We spend time together. We eat dinners together. Uh, we know each other. We get to know each other during that process. But also we, we know what to do with the company together. Uh, the CEO, us, but also the rest of the management team. So I think it's, um, it's, it's in our segment, it's probably one of the most Im important things to find the, the right CEO and, and get the right team in place. Right, I see. Um, and you've also touched on this before and that you're looking more towards the you know, transformational growth with small to mid-sized companies. Um, and, but there, there's competition out there. And what would you say is Procurita's competitive advantage in this space, if you were to define it? I think our competitive advantage is that we are doing the same thing uh, over and over again. We have a very defined investment strategy. Uh, obviously, we evolve and we develop, but the kind of deals, the type of companies that we invest in are more or less the same uh, time after time. And I think uh, now we just have a great track record, track record in helping these companies to grow. And I think that's if you look at competitive advantage, it's, it's partly that you have the experience, the knowledge, but it's also that you are able to tell uh, entrepreneurs, uh, business leaders, you know, what you have done with other companies, uh, how we can help you. And, and uh, I would say in most cases that we uh, see or companies we invest in, um, we want the management to choose us as a partner, uh, not just because we pay the highest price, but they think that we are a great partner to them. And, you know, we have done several deals that are nine, 10 times the money. Uh, and we have built tremendous uh, companies um, starting from pretty small scale. Mm. And I think that track record is, is uh, some sort of competitive advantage also in the deal process. Um, and I want to follow up on that just by talking, you know, one of the latest transactions that you've done, which is obviously with Sofa Company to Lars Larsen Group. 
Um, no. And that's raised a lot of interest because uh, during your ownership, you, the, you've, made, you, you've basically doubled the revenue to more, more than 500 million um, Danish kroners. So, uh, you know, do you mind talking a little bit more about you know, what you did well during your ownership uh, and why was this the right time to, you know, move on? No, but Sofa Company was a very interesting uh, deal for us because it was based. The reason we made Sofa Company was that we have invested in another online retailer called Peers. Right. So when we heard about Sofa Company, we felt that this is a great opportunity to create an online first player uh, within selling sofas. And uh, you know they they were already selling sofas online, but we thought there was a great potential in doing it. And, and you mentioned that we we doubled the revenues of the business, but. If you look at the, the part of the business that's sold uh, directly to the consumer or through online platforms, we actually five-folded uh, the sale uh, towards uh, the consumer part of the business. So it right. was a tremendous growth journey uh, in, in uh, basically on what we wanted to do to, to create an online first player uh, in Sofa Company. Uh, and I mentioned it. Uh, I mentioned Sofa Company and, and the uniqueness of the business model. But for us, it was very much in building up, um, taking this Danish company to become a European uh, company. Uh, and uh, we basically entered new markets. Uh, we grew in uh, in many European markets, uh, and uh, and we and, and through this uh, you know online um, platform. And then we also entered the US, and we started selling. Um, uh, our sofas on uh, Wayfair uh, primarily, which is uh, an, um, a third-party platform. Uh, and we could just see that uh, we had a unique business proposition uh, when we could sell this Danish design sofas to an affordable price. Uh, and uh, since we controlled also the production facility in Vietnam, it was, uh, it was just very high uh, quality also on the products. So we basically thought that we had a great product to great prices. And then we coupled that with very strong online marketing cap uh, capabilities in the company. Uh, you also asked, you know, why, why it was the right time to sell the company. And, and, you know, we want to sell the companies that when they are super strong. Uh, we basically saw a huge opportunities for Sofa Company uh, in the future. Uh, and, and it's always like, should we sell now or should we sell in one, two years time? But we want to sell a company that has a tremendous potential for the next buyer. Uh, and, uh, and the Sofa Company was a good example of that because we could see that you know, we were growing madly uh, and, and we were also making very good profits. Uh, and we could show that you know, there's a huge potential in Sofa Company and Lars Larsen Group really believed in that. And, 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 and we agreed on, on terms and... and I'm uh, pretty sure that they are a very happy uh, buyer and I'm 100% uh, sure that it's going to be a great investment also for them. Fantastic. I mean, um, and when, one interesting observation that, you know, one of my friends said was that it seems that a lot of these Nordic furniture companies really have the good designs that everyone wants to buy, the likes of IKEA, the likes of um, so a company. But, um, but no, that's really interesting to hear about. Um, and I wanted to move on a little bit more about, you know, the history of the firm, um, because um, Procuritas was the first firm in Sweden and Denmark to complete public to private management buyouts. Um, so just for our audiences, uh, what's uh, a, a management buyout and how significant were these pioneering deals um, in, you know, shaping your investment strategy later on? I think a management buyout is basically when you buy a company together with the management in the company. Um, and I would say that, as I mentioned before, you know, to team up with a good team, a good management is, uh, is, uh, is crucial for us. It's mm -hmm. uh, something we strongly believe in. Uh, and uh, so I would say that the history of Procuritas, uh, the, the fact that we made the first management buyouts I think yeah, it's yeah. actually quite, uh, you know, I haven't really thought about it that way, but it's probably a very important part of our DNA that we see ourselves as a partner with management. Uh, and I, I can just see that in so many cases, we go to a management team and say, you know, do you want to do a growth journey together with us? Uh, and we want to do it together. We don't want to do it as an angry financial investor. We want to do it as a business partner to you. So it's probably, uh, I haven't really thought about it that way, but maybe 
all of the from the history of the first days of Procuritas. Um, it could be could be a big, very big part of our DNA. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and to just to move on from that and talk a little bit more about the ESG side. Um, and so obviously here in Sweden, you have uh, Greta Thunberg, who's one of the leading young activists um, who are promoting ESG values. Um, and my question is, when was the first time when the topic of ESG was brought up in your investment decision-making process? I know that we became UNPRI signatories already in 2012. So right. I would say it's been a, an integral, in, integral part of our investment process since then. Mm-hmm. And I would say that, you know, the, the last three, four, five years, it has just increased uh, tremendously in, in, in importance for us, but also for, I think, business in general, uh, the industry in general, I think it's a super high focus on, on ESG. And can you talk a little bit more about yeah, um, Procurita's ESG strategy right now? I think our main uh, objective is that we want every portfolio company to make a step change in the, in the uh, ESG uh, area. I think if I look back, you know, it was f- primary or historically it was more com- compliance focused to make yeah, sure yeah. that our suppliers, uh, you know, follow the code of conduct, etc. But I see it more as a central part of winning customers, winning business, and I have so many examples of you know sofa company again. You know we made a sofa in uh, recycled uh, pet bottles, uh, fabric and recycled pet bottles. Uh, we did it because you know we thought it was was a good thing for winning customers uh, and showing the sofa company is a company that uh, cares about the environment. We have bought another children apparel company called Polan and Puret, uh, and uh, you know it's a super strong ESG focus in that company and. And the main objective for uh, Poland period is, is basically to sell products that are so durable so they can be, uh, you know, the, the next child can take over them. Uh, so, you know, we're, our business is to make so good products, we don't sell any new products, but, but uh, we strongly believe that that is, uh, that is good for the long term. And, and just to go further a little bit in terms of the ESG and how that plays overall in the private equity space, now, in, in the Nordic region, uh, businesses have always famously been at the forefront in, you know, leading change, leading, you know, the ESG integration part. Do you think that at some point we're going to see ESG metrics being as significant as, you know, the other financial metrics that most companies will be looking at? Or is it more as, um, are you taking, you know, do you take a more distinct approach in looking at it as of an additional part? To valuing a company? No, I would say it's uh, in in some cases it's already there. You know, the ESG metrics are, uh, you know, we focus strongly on non financial metrics uh, when we uh, decide if it's a good company to buy or not, and especially in uh, in, in the ESG area. Uh, I can give an example of a company called the Verksta. Uh, Verksta is a company um, basically. Uh, repairing cars when they have crashed uh, or if you have a dent on the car. Uh, We uh, have extremely strong focus on making sure that when we repair the cars, uh, first of all, we repair rather than replace the part. And if we need to replace the part, uh, we uh, try to find a second hand part or uh, in last case, uh, a new part. And, you know, to to make sure uh, we, we, you know, we steer the organization that way. And then we have super strong follow-up on the on the fin- uh, on the metrics to make sure that you know the number of plastic repairs increase and the number of used parts increase. But th- this is actually something that we uh, report back to the insurance companies uh, that pays the bill as well, because also the insurance companies are focusing a lot on the ESG and they want to be more sustainable. And if we can show that if you give Verksta more volumes vis-a-vis a competitor. Uh, you will you will be <laughs> saving the planet. <laughs> you will you we will use more uh, repairs. We will use more secondhand parts, and it's good for the planet. And yeah, it's yeah. a super strong strong uh, interest from the insurance companies to to become more sustainable themselves. So it's it's you know we follow the metrics to make sure we steer the organization in that way, and that makes us win business. And have you? Um, so I tried to replicate that in other European countries as well. Um, or is that, do you think that's 
sort of part of a culture thing that's unique to Nordic countries. No, but I think it's, uh, I would say that uh, Sweden and, and the Nordic countries are at the forefront of the ESG area. So, you know, I'm talking to a lot of investors and I can really see that we are, we have, we have taken certain steps uh, and we are a little bit in the forefront in this area. Mm. I'm 100% sure that this will come uh, across the globe. And, and I think, you know, we have certain uh, examples of uh, private equity firms focus on, uh, focusing on impact investing. And uh, we have a couple of cases in Sweden, but they are popping up everywhere in the world. So I think it's, uh, it, it's great because I think it can change a lot of things um, that people actually care where to invest. And, and, uh, and then good companies will get money and bad campus will, companies will not get money. So I think it's, it's great. Absolutely. It's a great trend at least. Exactly. No, like you said, um, and and I don't think that night right now. I want to move on to the macro part of private equity, which also touches on what we discussed just now. Um, so here's one of the facts that we have here, which is the rankings by the World Intellectual Property Organization in 2020 put Sweden in second place in terms of the most innovative countries. Uh, now, obviously, you work with a lot of um, tech firms and also ones that are, you know, innovating in traditional industries. And there's a view that, you know, traditionally countries with socialist friendly country uh, policies tend to discourage in innovation and growth. But I believe that from your experience, both at Ericsson and now uh, in the mid-market startup space, you can see why that's not really the case. So in your opinion, what's the secret or, you know, what's the reason why Nordic countries have been successful in promoting innovation in the various different uh, fields? That's a, good, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I'm the right person to, to answer that because I think it's potentially it's, uh, it's probably closer to the venture capital area. We are you know, working more with a late, a later stage growth investment. So we are potentially focusing a little bit less on you know, innovation as such, but more on, on helping companies to grow. But just from 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 an outside perspective, I think the the Nordic countries have a very sound business environment. Just in general, you know, with with good transparency, uh, lack of corruption, uh, you know, focus on ESG. We have good educational system, and and uh, you know, so we have the you know the platform for for that. Uh, why you know there's uh, in you said they are socialist countries, but we are good at innovation. I'm. I'm not sure I'm, I'm the right person to, to you know, say why. One thing it's, it strikes me a little bit is that you know, Sweden and, and, and all Nordic countries has been quite successful in making big companies or creating big companies. And you know, we have in many industries, we have Ericsson, we have uh, Volvo, Scania, Atlas Copco, Asabloy, whatever. You know, they're in, in so many different sectors. And I think that's, that, uh, you know, if you have very successful companies in one sector, it spills over to other sectors. Uh, and I think just the fact that Sweden and the Nordic countries are so small, is just very natural for us to, to go international. So I think that is, um, that is a reason why, why we have created some, some very international companies. And also um, another economic consultancy in the Nordic regions has said that you know, since 2007, private equity has increased Sweden's GDP by close to 5%. Um, and so I wanted to ask, first of all, during this period of time, obviously when you're working in private equity, uh, what's the biggest difference that you see between then and now? Um, and what do you think you know, is so one of the misconceptions that the public has on private equity? Uh, I think the... Uh, the main difference is that the whole industry is more professionalized uh, uh, and, and obviously more competitive just in general. I think it's, uh, to me, it's obvious that uh, the, the, the industry consists of, uh, you know, some very good firms uh, like Procuritas uh, and that, that are winners today, but they will also be winners in the, in the long term. Uh, but it also consists, consists of some gold diggers that, you know, it's good times uh, and, and they are able to get some money together and, and they will start investing. I'm, I'm not sure or I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of them will not survive. Um, so I think it's, you know, you have really good firms, but then you have also 
potential question marks. Um, some of them will probably survive and, and uh, make good deals, but uh, but not for, sh uh, for sure. Um, I think the biggest misconception that, that I think is that uh, private equity is short-sighted. You know, we are, we are not short-sighted at all. As I mentioned before, you know, we invest, uh, we want to keep the company for five to seven years and we want to sell a, a super strong company. That means that when we plan, you know, the value creation in our companies, we have a 10 year perspective, 15 year perspective, because we want to create a really strong player. And that's not short sighted at all. I think it's rather if you have R and a stock exchange and you have to care about the next quarterly report, then mm -hmm. uh, there is a risk that you're short sighted. That, that, but that private equity investors are short sighted, I, I don't think that's correct. 100%. Um, and just in general, in terms of a precarious operation, you said how you know it's natural for Nordic companies and businesses to uh, go international, given the size of the Nordic region. Um, would Procuritas ever consider you know expanding into other European countries or you know even internationally? Uh, I think it's uh, what well, I think uh, focus is uh, important just in general in business, and it's probably one of the most important words that you should should bear in mind uh, when making investment that should, you should be focused. If I, I, I would not rule out that we would go uh, international or do deals outside the Nordic countries, but we would only do it in sectors, uh, segments, type of companies that we know. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, we want to do investments, the same kind of investment over and over again. And if we did uh, investment in Germany, it would be in a company or a situation that we have done before. Um, and also in general, with private capital being more accessible, in Europe and particularly in Nordic market, the Nordic market, um, what, in your view, what's the future function of public stock markets? But I think uh, uh, in in the Nordic countries uh, we have had a very strong IPO market. Uh, so I think uh, the first uh, I've been in Procuritas for 19 years. The first 15 years uh, the stock market was closed as an exit route for our companies and. And the last four years, it has been a, a very, very active IPO market. Uh, so I think it's, it changes over time. Um, I think, you know, the, the public market is one way. The private market is, is one way. I think right now it's very strong interest for doing IPOs. Uh, so the public market is strong. Uh, I, I would say if the, if the market becomes a little bit more uncertain, uh, then, the, then I would say that the private market is, is probably coming back. Um, and yeah, and to move on to general questions, um, so in, in terms of your personal career, um, so you personally speak a number of different languages, including Swedish, English, French. Um, have we missed any here? Uh, not really. And, and, I, I would actually say that maybe it's exaggerated. I'm not sure I'm fluent in French, but I, I, I lived in France. And I, I at least spoke a little bit of France, French. I see. Um, and are you learning any new languages? Because my question is, what what do you think is the significance of being multilingual? And you know, the you know, what how significant it, is it itself of you know mastering different languages? I just told my kids uh, last week when we were in Mallorca that I uh, I think I, uh, or I gonna learn Spanish. I said so. <laughs> <laughs> but really? uh, I actually, honestly, I think that. If I look back at my 19 years in Procuritas, when I went to Denmark in Jutland in Denmark in, in two, 2005, it would be very difficult to make a, a deal in Denmark in Jutland. Uh, first of all, culturally, but also the language barrier was big. Uh, I see in the last five years, it has turned quite quickly uh, and you get around with English much, much better than you, than you did before. And I think it goes the same for Germany, it goes the same for France and um, in Italy, that also people in uh, 20, 25, 30 year old uh, people have started to, to learn English. And I think it's just the beginning because, you know, if I look back, um, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people uh, watched uh, television or TV shows and they were all dubbed. Uh, okay. And if you go to a 15, 20 year old uh, uh, it, a German today, I'm 100% sure they, they use YouTube and they watch a lot of English uh, speaking uh, uh, shows. 
So I think this um, the, the the learning of English is just uh, increasing dramatically. I, I would I would guess, which okay. basically means that you should be able to make business in in uh, English uh, uh, all over Europe. Mm. And also, so for um, for Nordic and other international students who are studying abroad, um, how would you advise them on choosing between starting their career in their country of origin versus their current country of study? Because obviously, um, you know, you've studied in Sweden, you've also studied in France, but you chose to start a career back in Sweden. Um, so how would you advise students um, in making that decision? Uh, you know, I'm 100% sure to go abroad. It's, uh, you know, I started in, uh, I went to school in Sweden, then I went uh, to, uh, to, uh, to France, uh, and then I actually worked in London. And then I moved back to France and then by coincidence, I ended up in Sweden. But right. it's such a great experience to live in another country and live in another culture. So I would advise anyone uh, to go abroad and, and get the experience. I think it's just a great, great, great thing for, for anyone. Right, I see. Um, and also just generally in business, um, what field or sector excites you most at the moment? Or, you know, one that you would recommend students to keep a close eye on or to, you know, get involved in potentially? No, but I think uh, what if I look at our investments lately, uh, you know, the online retailers, the online, uh, the online uh, investments are, uh, you know, amazing. You know, the scalability of online companies is just amazing. And I, I would say that, you know, digitally native brands, uh, brands that have started you know, digitally and, and sell their products uh, digitally. Mm. The potential in those companies is just uh, amazing. So I think it's uh, definitely one of the, the most interesting uh, you know, investments uh, right now. And, and obviously you have plenty of examples of companies that have started from basically nothing and, and very rapidly uh, scaled up. Um, in, not only in their own country but also internationally. Um, and given given how you know how quickly the business world changes, and you've said how you know the way of you interacting with customers changes very quickly as well. Um, how do you personally approach you know the process of learning new stuff? I think it's just to be open minded, uh, just in general. Uh, actually look at what ki your kids are uh, doing, what they are uh, watching. Uh, I actually ask my kids sometimes if they think there is a company I should look at, if, they, if there is a brand I, they know I, that I don't know. Uh, so I think uh, to, to be open and, uh, and, and want to find out, I think it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and what does leadership mean to you? I think being a Swede and... Uh, and uh, especially in Procuritas, for me, it's more uh, about teamwork and making sure that you get the team uh, in place that work well together. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, in, if I look at private equity in general and, and how uh, I, I see other firms and our leaders in, in our industry, I think it's more hierarchic and, and uh, you know, more dominated by, by one or, or a few individuals. You know, we try to nurture a culture that's uh, decentralized and, you know, people uh, even at young level, uh, levels are, are allowed to take responsibility and or even um, we want them to take responsibility. And that, that can be anything from in early, early on in their career to assume board positions, to, to be a central part of the investment teams. Um, so leadership for me is, is uh, more about coaching than to tell people what to do and make sure that, you know, the talent that we have, that they, uh, that they flourish and, and uh, develop. Uh, so I think that, that is probably leadership to me. How do you personally view risk in general? You know, how do you sort of think about it in terms of you making decisions? It's a good question. I think you have to take risk to generate returns. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, sometimes in, internally I say that um, no guts, no glory. <laughs> <laughs> I basically, I, I actually believe that you, you have to accept uh, certain types of risks. But it's, you know, when I, when I go skiing, I like to go off-piste skiing. Um, 
and uh, you know to take risks that I cannot control uh, or take passages uh, when you go skiing that are dangerous uh, you should not do um, but uh, or, or when the the con the, the uh, consequence of you falling or something is too big uh, you should not go there so you should take risks that are uh, that you can control in one way or another uh, and it can be uh, if you make a a deal or a business if you have a, a customer concentration for instance uh, if if a customer is too big if it's 50 percent of your revenue uh, even if you do the diligence even if you feel, feel comfortable with that risk you should not you should not take that risk it's a risk that you cannot control it's it's always a customer that can do something else or choose to do something else and it's just a type of risk that you should not take mm. so you have to take risks but you have to you it should be risk that can be controlled and that can be mitigated and right now what do you think is one of the uh, most concerning business risk that you see where that's been you know another covid variant you know, supply chain um, issues or, you know, inflation in general, what would you say is uh, the biggest risk that you see at the moment? There are many risks out there. I think, you know, you always have a, uh, a situation in, in some companies and, and uh, where you have supply chain problems that you don't find the raw material or the raw materials increase in price so much. Uh, we, we can see that uh, products from uh, from Far East becomes more expensive, which will uh, eventually probably lead to inflation. Um, personally, I'm probably more concerned about you know a, a setback on the financial markets because the, it it has been too it has the environment of the last what is it ten years has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only thing you know that it will not continue forever. Uh, at some point, there will be a setback. So you basically just have to make sure that you did your, you know, your businesses are sound and, and you can survive a uh, setback in the financial markets. I, see. I think that is probably the, my my main concern. When when will the this, the the very strong market uh, start declining? And and I think that's interesting. So when COVID first hit, um, do you mind talking a little bit more about, you know, what was your reaction? Um, were there anything that you did with your you know, portfolio companies in order to hedge against, you know, the potential disruption brought forward by COVID? Um, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about that. We have been around for such a long time. So we have seen many you know, setbacks in the market and, and recessions. And I think this was probably one of the least expected yeah. <laughs> that way. Uh, so basically what we did uh, in uh, early March, uh, we, we heard about something in China in, in was it the end of January, February in 2020. But uh, already when we were back from the uh, winter break in, in end of February, beginning of March, we basically had all hands on deck we told all our portfolio companies, around 15 portfolio companies, to weekly send us um, uh, cash flow uh, projections, uh, cash, flow, cash, cash flow status and cash flow projections for the next uh, uh, months. Uh, and I think we had a cost out program in uh, almost all companies uh, because we basically just wanted to prepare for the worst. We, we had no clue, basically, where we would end up. Uh, so I think what we learned was that in many cases it was not as bad as we expected, um, but we ended up with companies that were um, that were much uh, in much better shape uh, when after the crisis or the COVID crisis than than before. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, looking back, I think we have had the best one and a half two years in Procuritas history uh, over this um, pandemic. So. Mm-hmm. That's interesting times. Absolutely. No, that's really interesting. Um, so I'll move on to the last section of the interview, um, which is the lightning round. So I'll shoot over a couple of questions and I'd love to hear, you know, what you think about those and your answers. So, um, so are there any past or present figures that you look up to? And, and could you tell us why? Um, the one uh, person I uh, looked up to was my grandfather. Uh, when he was uh, still still alive, he was uh, he was probably the first businessman, uh, you know, in a small scale. But uh, you know, he was 
he liked business and and uh, so that's uh, at least some, someone I looked up to. Uh, you know, in more recent times, um, he unfortunately passed away uh, some time ago. But um, in more recent times, you know, you have plenty of examples. I think you mentioned Greta Thunberg before. She's an uh, extraordinary example of of a young schoolgirl that just wants to change the world and. Uh, Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm sure that in 20 years' time we will look back and, and, and still remember Greta Thunberg. So, yeah. someone to, obviously someone to look up to. Absolutely. Um, and what would you say is one of the best decisions you've made throughout your career? No, for me, it's probably to move uh, into the investment field, to work with investments. Um, and, and especially in, in you know, our size of the segment, um, you know, not not the big the biggest investment uh, you know the where you have you know too much competition and, and too much um, you know london investment bankers but uh, uh, to work in the companies where you can actually add value i think it suits me very well and something i really uh, think is fun basically absolutely and when you make a new hire what are the top three qualities that you look for in them The most important parameter for us when we recruit someone is what we call that some, the person has passion for business. Mm-hmm. Uh, even on, on the most junior level, we want to see you know the we want to see in their eyes. Then when you start talking about uh, companies, uh, strategy, uh, business development, that uh, someone likes to discuss that. And uh, I think that's uh, probably the most important. Uh, quality that we are looking for uh, in, in new hires from junior to senior level basically and and it's it suits our market segment and, and it suits obviously it suits procure us very well another thing that's super important for us is diversity in general diversity of backgrounds um, diversity in personalities diversity in uh, gender so we focus very much on building a team that uh, with high level of diversity so that's another thing. We, we basically think it's good to have a balance in the team. Yeah. I see. Yeah, and then you've talked to the previous day about you know, the role of leadership. I think that's very interesting to note. Um, and what are some of the best books that you've read that shaped your worldview and you know, how you think about different things? Uh, obviously many. I think one uh, that, that changed... Uh, uh, how, how you look at things is obviously uh, this uh, book called Factfulness by Hans Rosling. It's, uh, it's, I think it's a bestseller also internationally. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away, but it um, it's gives a lot of insight uh, about uh, the world and, and uh, <laughs> how things are incorrect uh, that, or the, the way we view things is incorrect. Mm. There is another book I actually came to think about is uh, called, um, in Swedish, it's called Järnstark. It's um, strong brain or something uh, it's uh, Anders Hansen he's a psychiatrist that uh, written a book about that you should physical training is good for your brain uh, and uh, you know you should have um, physical training uh, four times a week that, uh, that makes you uh, with that your pulse has to increase to a certain level uh, and it good for your brain and, and he, he built a storyline in a very scientific way we'll have to check that out after yeah. this um, and post-COVID, um, which country or area do you want to visit the most? Um, I mean, we're currently sort of in that region already, but um, is there any, you know, travel you know, places that you really want to travel or visit? I just came back from Mallorca, so in Spain. So <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, have I've not been able to travel for one and a half year. So I think yeah, basically any country is, is, is good right now. <laughs> Everyone wants to just go traveling. Which is uh, unfortunately something we have. I think we have to consider uh, how much traveling we should do given the the climate uh, uh, problems that we have. So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see how we can adapt in the way we are living. Absolutely. Um, and if you can tell your twenty-year-old self anything, what would it be? Um, I think. Uh, to find, if, if I'm talking about, you know, work and where to work, I think to find companies with good values and, uh, in, and solid people um, and, and a long-term perspective, I think that's, uh, that's important to bear in mind. And, and because it's, it's so many people just want to 
get the brand name on their, on their CV or, or, or get the, an experience for doing something else. So I think uh, to focus on companies with, with solid values and, and, um, yeah, and, and good people, I think it's, uh, it's important to, to think about. Absolutely. And another thing is also that, you know, I go, uh, go traveling, uh, do fun things in life. Um, uh, you know, I remember, remember when I was a student, I was so afraid of taking a half a year off or a year off would look bad on my CV, but uh, that's nonsense. It's just great for your CV. And I think we, <laughs> at least the uh, procurators, when we meet people and, uh, and, you, and, and if someone has not taken any time off or not traveled the world, we, we would look and ask uh, if what's wrong with that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what have you done? Um, no, yeah, I mean, that, that's all the questions that I have today. But, um, but no, thank you so much, Matthias, for taking the time. I think that was really, really insightful. Thanks a lot. It was uh, nice uh, talking to you.